And welcome back to the show. More than a thousand people are killed by police violence each year in America. Campaign Zero is a policy reform campaign encouraging policymakers to focus on solutions with the strongest evidence of effectiveness in reducing police violence. Now, the campaign believes by implementing the right policy and systemic changes, there can be an end to police killings and other forms of police violence in the United States. Joining me now to discuss more is the co-founder of Campaign Zero, DeRay McKesson. And uh, DeRay, good to have you. It's so good to be here. Well, when we talk front and center about the issue of police, I think we can have hours worth of conversation. Uh, but when we talk about where we are today, policy, um, and really shifting the narrative towards policy, um, give me a little bit about your organization's work and how policy is a part of that. Yes, I was one of the original protesters in Ferguson in 2014. And at the end of those protests every day, we were in the street for 400 days. We were trying to figure out how do we end police violence? What's the structural fix? So one of the first projects we did was a camp, uh, site called Mapping Police Violence, where we just literally mapped out how many people the police were killing. There wasn't good data back then. You know, now we know the police kill about 1,100 people a year. You, know, you think about 2020. In 2020, the police killed more people than every single year of data we have except for one. If the police killed you before 2013, we literally don't know, which is sort of wild. So that was our ground zero. And then we went on to do the first ever campaign around police unions and then the first ever campaign around use of force policies. And those are really our three big anchor projects. And, and we do a lot more now, but those are the three big ones uh, that we continue to do that were the first things that we did. Yeah. And when we think about what these numbers look like, they're very startling. Uh, it's not startling to us because we know exactly what's happening. But when you take that number and you share it with the wider population, um, what is what response do you get? It's interesting. I think that you know, 2020 was a was a weird year because there was so much publicity around the protests that people felt like it was getting better. They were like, you know what? Like we went outside, things changed, and the numbers actually showed the opposite. Things did not change. Things stayed as bad as they had been. And it's a reminder that the police are sort of impervious to bad PR. That unless the structures change, unless the rules change, and the police are sort of fine. So. That's sort of the takeaway from 2020. I think that what we also realize that there are a lot of people and, and legislators across legislatures across the country who really want to do well. We just have to figure out how to how to show them what the well looks like. And most people in the criminal justice space, the experts focus on prisons, jails, and arrests. They actually don't focus on the police. And we sort of start from a police first perspective, because we'd say you can't name three ways you get to prison or jail that don't include a police officer. The police are actually the beginning of all of this. Yeah. And when you look at the police, obviously, there's a lot that needs to be discussed. Uh, you know, how the community can actually play a part of that. You did say three ways that you don't know, end up going to jail and the police are in all three of them. There's no way there's no way around it. They're going to be connected. But community also plays an important part, too, in terms of how there's oversight with the police. Um, we know that there's civilian complaint review boards. Some have been approved across the United States. Some are being rejected. Uh, how do we approach the issue of community oversight uh, when we've got these massive issues that are happening within the police department? Yeah, I think really the devil's in the detail. So most of the civilian oversight boards have very little power and have not been very effective. You think about New York, it's probably one of the most uh, effective in the country and still the best they can do is make a recommendation, right? They can recommend things to the chief. The chief doesn't have to take them. Uh, that's not really oversight. We think that the community is the best arbiter of how safe the community is and what that looks like. And they should be able to fire police officers. They should be able to fire police chief. You think about places like Wisconsin, they've had a very old law, a uh, hundred years old, uh, that gives a group of citizens the power to fire the police chief. The problem is that that committee is 100% appointed by the mayor. Yeah, the mayor right. also appoints the police, right? So it's like you find these interesting models, but there's always a wrinkle somewhere in the details. So part of the work is to do real civilian oversight where there is a, a group of civilians who have the power and the authority you know, in Maryland, there's a police reform bill that just passed last year that will be one of the first that really does put the power in the hand of civilians to make disciplinary decisions. Mm. When we talk about, you know, the power, community policing is huge. And I mean, when we talk about the community having a large, well, a large, uh, let me put it like this, the community having a large impact in the way that things are determined. Uh, but I want to talk for a minute about police reform. And this really with this, you know, the segment is really going to center on a lot is about reform. And when we talk about reform, I know one of the issues that comes to mind when we talk about reform is 
uh, accountability and how that accountability is actually played out. When you look at the issue of accountability amongst police officers, we know in New York you've got 50A, where we now get to find out about disciplinary measures concerning police. Um, what other areas of reform really strike out to you that you'd like to see hit home? So the, you know, the first bucket is about reducing the power of the police. We should restrict heavily when they can use force. We should make sure that they can't do high speed chases. You know, we should restrict when they can do not knock raids. Like there's a host of things that like, they just have a lot of power that is used in ways that have no measures of success and no accountability. So like, that's one. The second is part of it is actually just investing in alternatives to police. In New York, there's a great study that was done about a decade ago that showed that uh, for every 10 nonprofits that, it, that exist in a neighborhood, crime decreases. And that makes sense. The more support people have, different options they make that makes total sense and the third is mass incarceration ending mass incarceration that we lock up far too many people for the most simple things and it's like should you you know in new jersey today if you steal over 200 dollars, that's considered a felony you can get up to 18 months in prison in new jersey for stealing over 200 dollars. that's wild why right uh, so the third part is those things and i think about these these three strategies all in tandem and when we think about broken window policing, I had a conversation just earlier on the show talking about bo broken window policing. It's something that it continues to exist, but it's also something that needs to end. Yeah, so like broken level, broken windows, uh, broken windows policing is this idea of uh, this idea that the low level offenses really matter. So if you focus on the low level things, you stop the big things. So that's why you arrest the graffiti artist, because if you arrest them, it sends a signal. That's like the idea. The reality is that like it doesn't. And that like, do you, you know, even if I think graffiti is bad, do I need to put you in a cage? No, right? Even if I think stealing like a pack of gum is a bad thing, uh, we can think about accountability that doesn't lead to cages. And that's where we sort of fight the police on this idea that the only accountability is putting people in cages. And what we would say is that our, our real lives show something different. You've had conflict in your life. You've been in school, you've been in church, you've been at home where people have done wrong things and putting people in cages wasn't like the first or best or only option. Right, well, give me uh, a little bit more about this issue here. I talk a lot about residency and how residency actually could actually make a difference. When we talk about police officers, many times police officers are not living within the city, particularly in New York City. You don't have to live there. There's no residency requirement. In fact, there's a decree that says you, you don't have to worry about living in the city. And the argument is, well, New York City is pretty expensive to live in, so our people live outside of there. But there's something to be said about cultural competency. When an officer actually lives in the community, you become a part of the community, you treat the community different. Agree, disagree? Yeah, so uh, it is less about whether I agree or not. The data doesn't necessarily support this idea that residency matters. Uh, just like there's a slim argument that the race of officers matters. Uh, there's a, a research that suggests that when the department's over 30% black, then officers do use less force. And there's also a scant research to suggest that more women officers actually lead to less force. But here's the thing about residency or not residency. Imagine if you had a job where you knew it was impossible to get in trouble. It doesn't matter if you live next door to me. It doesn't matter if you live 10 towns over or three states over, you'll do whatever you want. And that's not really a residency thing. And that's really the police issue that, you know, you know that Derek Chauvin got convicted in, in Minneapolis, which you probably don't know is that the police get 1100 people a year and the highest number of convictions ever in a given year is 11. Yeah. 11. 11. Yeah, so, like you, so 1%, right? So like as an right. officer who kills, 99% chance to not get convicted. And the likelihood that you get fired is also really, really slim, you know? Yeah, and that's and that's scary and that's hard. One of the things that really made the difference for the George Floyd case was that it was on videotape, but it wasn't a body cam per se that got it. It was a young lady that got it. Now we have the conversation about body cams. Talk to me about where you stand in seeing body cams on all police officers. Yeah, so there's an argument to be made that we should film the police, whether it's dash cams, whether it's citizens, whether it's body cams, if not only because seeing is believing that we said this stuff was happening for years and people didn't believe it until they saw it. Remember that George Floyd's death was listed as a medical emergency first. It was not listed as murder. They said that he essentially had a heart attack. 
until we saw the video. So videos have been important. The hard part is that even with videos in a lot of places, it hasn't led to what you and I would consider to be accountability. Chauvin was sort of like the perfect storm. It was the police, remember the police chief testified against Derek Chauvin, right? right? So it was like, you know, every, if he didn't get convicted, it would have been really wild because everything coalesced. But again, he is, still just one of a handful again the highest number ever in a given year is 11 and there's a lot of body camera footage out there yeah so talk to me about your work i mean obviously you do a lot in in the area of advocacy and dealing with policy uh you mentioned that you were out there in ferguson walk us through that experience of just being out there in ferguson yeah, you know it was it, it's so interesting the way time moves because 2014 feels so old to a lot of people that they don't <laughs> even remember that uh, but what was so powerful about 2014 is that uh, there were no organizations that started the protests. Like people came outside and said enough is enough. People like just cut coming outside and, and saying enough was enough. And it really spread across the world and the country in a really beautiful way. It set the foundation for the summer of 2020. It allowed people to start to think about and scrutinize the police. Remember in St. Louis in 2014, it was a no-fly zone over St. Louis. They're like, that's why there's no aerial footage of the protests. Everything we did was on Twitter. Uh, there was no Instagram Live, Facebook Live. Like we were, we were using Vine. It was illegal to stand still in 2014 in St. Louis. If we stood still for more than five seconds, we were arrested. I mean, it was a really wild place that really set everybody up to think about this issue differently. But to some extent, it is the work of what went on in Ferguson and really the advocacy and really stepping out and being aggressive about saying enough is enough that really paved the way for what we saw even in George Floyd. Absolutely. And without Ferguson, there is nothing else. It, that's why it's so hard to see it be erased in the national conversation, because people act like 2020 just emerged. You know, I know a lot of people who did nothing in 2014 and they regretted it and they said if the moment ever rises again i will do something and i think 2020 for a lot of people was that moment they watched 2014 from home they saw us in the street and they were like wow i probably should have stepped up and they were radicalized over those couple years in between 2014 and 2020 and then when 2020 comes they're like i got it they're like i'm gonna put my body on the line too because this matters and it's like yes yeah so you are the co-founder of campaign zero talk to us about campaign zero so yeah, so we're focused on solutions. So there are 19 states that have passed use of force uh, laws in the past year, over 350 cities. It's the single biggest reduction in the power of the police in American history. Uh, every single law restricting no-knock raids we wrote, there are about nine states that did it in the past year. And we lead the work on limiting the power of police unions across the country. So those are some of the campaigns that we have. But, but that's our thing is that like the police know intimately that unless the system changes, nothing will change. Yeah. And talk to us about the New York City Police Department, because obviously uh, we've had our runs with uh, Pat Lynch several times, uh, you know, just really trying to understand where he's coming from. And for most of us uh, who work in the field of journalism, we can honestly say that it's been a quite challenge to uh, to, to get some leveling from him uh, in many in many areas. But for, as one that works in policy advocacy and working uh, with police unions, uh, talk to us about your work uh, and how you perceived uh, the New York City Police Department. Yeah, so NYPD, uh, you know, has all of its challenges that we know it's the biggest police department in the country. One of the biggest with regard to discipline is that the police chief has the sole power to discipline all 30,000 officers. He alone does, which is wild. Uh, so <laughs> there really is no oversight mechanism. He doesn't have to really do anything. So there's a lot that just gets swept under the rug, a lot that just never happens because there is no other mechanism for anybody else, including the mayor, to discipline a police officer in New York City. Remember that the NYPD settles around 200 to 300 million dollars a year because of police misconduct which is wild so you know a lot of problems the civilian review board uh, does investigations they do make recommendations but they're non-binding so one of the biggest changes in the city would be to change that you what is your focus on right now so same thing, still the police. So we're ramping up for next legislative cycle. So we have a lot of campaigns that we're percolating on, trying to get ready for January when most of the legislatures open back up. You probably didn't know, I didn't know that places like Nevada only pass laws every other year. So some no, of I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, no, not everybody passes laws every year. So we're trying to get ready for the places that do pass laws next year and then do some groundwork in the places that, are, that aren't gonna pass laws to the next year. Wow. So out of all of this, what has been the most fruitful of the work that you've been doing? I mean, is it seeing a children conviction? Is it seeing, you know, some of this legislation that has been long time ignored now being recognized? 
No, I think that the biggest is that I remember in 2014, people thought we were crazy, right? People were like, you're being <laughs> Yeah. No, I remember we went to some cities and people were like, don't bring that mess here. Don't bring, and you're like, bring it to you. The police are killing people in your neighborhood. You just don't know, but like, they're already there. I'm not bringing it to you. Whereas now people get it. You know, when we did this big project on police unions in 2015, people inside the social justice community didn't want to do it. Like now everybody's talking about police unions, but we did it in 2015 and people literally were like, that's cute. And now people are like, that's a big deal. And we're like, yes, it's a big deal, right? So so that is probably the biggest sea change. You know, we're proud that everything that we have done, we have led on and defined the space, but there's so much more to do. Yeah. And so as you look with so much more to do, obviously we know that, uh, as you said, you're focusing on laws and policy. Um, and do you think that when we talk about police right now, uh, that conversation between police and community, do you think that it's getting better given the fact that we are, we have seen the convictions, we have seen more people becoming active, more people stepping out? Is that is that conversation gap getting better? So I think what's happening, I think that, I think, you know, when we poll people, people still generally like the police. But when we ask them, would you change and then insert something here across the board, people say yes. People are hungry now in a way for a structural change. We have to make sure that we meet the moment, but people want it. And so for people who want to help to do the work that you do and be connected to your organization, how do you do that? Just go to campaignzero.org. We are there. Uh, go check out the campaigns, get involved. If you want to get involved, there's work to be done in every community. Yeah. And as an advocate, you know, taking to the streets, obviously you said when this thing happened, people just took to the streets. There was no real mass organization. It was just anger. Um, give me just a little bit before we go about how things have actually coalesced to become more of not just the individual, but now a corporate matter. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know yet. There are a lot of places that that pledge to do something. We have to see what they're going to do. So I don't really have a great answer to that because I haven't seen a lot of corporations do structural things around the police. I think that corporations have tried to do work internally with their own companies, and that's that's good. That's not the work that I lead on. I lead mm -hmm. on change around the police. So I don't know yet. I think that that might have been more of a PR spin for a lot of places uh, than structural. But we'll see. We'll be making ass of corporate America for the next legislative cycle, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll have a better sense. Yeah. And speaking of PR, got to give an opportunity for let you uh, talk a little bit about your book. So show us a little bit about your book and what readers can uh, enjoy. It's called The Other Side of Freedom. It is uh, an exploration both of the early set of protests and then how we should think about policing and think about public safety in a way that actually does help us get beyond the police as key to public safety. Uh, OK, where people where can people pick it up? They can just go, uh, if you go to Duray.com, just my name, you'll be able to uh, buy it, but it's everywhere books are sold. So in stores, on Amazon, wherever you buy books. How long did it take you to get to, to put that together? Forever, it almost killed me, but I'm <laughs> happy the book is out. <laughs> well, Duray, I want to thank you for coming to be with us here on the Social Justice Forbes. Uh, definitely welcome back to, uh, you're welcome to come back and share with us and let us know uh, what's happening. And if you want to raise your voice on the matter, you got an open platform here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. All right, Duray McKesson, our guest here on the Social Justice Forums.